Good afternoon, and welcome to In the Garden. I'm Melissa Siegel, your moderator and Montgomery County Master Gardener, and our experts today are Susan Eisendraft, Montgomery County Master Gardener, and Steve Duback, Director of Montgomery County Master Gardeners University of Maryland Extension. We provide many services in the county for our uh, residents. Some of them include our speakers group, which many of our members go out to different clubs and places to give talks on gardening, demonstration gardens, youth gardening programs, which have just started up again for since the pandemic, therapeutic horticulture, special events, and Ask a Master Gardener. Today, our presenter is Susan Eisendrath, and she's going to talk about gardening and composting. Susan? Thank you, Melissa and Steve, for inviting me today. Um, and hello to all of you out in Facebook land, um, or however you're accessing this. Um, composting is one of my main um, responsibilities with the Master Gardeners, both teaching and doing. And of course, it's the foundation of any garden. Um, and I just wanted to sort of give you an update on what's happening here in the county on composting. And then we'll be answering questions related to composting that's more spe specific to the garden. Um, what's happening about composting in the county? Well, there's quite a bit. The county is making progress on the, their strategic plan for composting and compost use. The goals of the plans are to increase composting for commercial entities, expand residential backyard composting, and include food scraps, launch a curbside composting and food scrap program, and then also expand on-farm composting. And they want to also introduce community composting. So there's a lot of opportunities to get involved at different levels. The county is also exploring options to recycle food scraps instead of burning their food waste. Residents in the county, when they throw away their food, it actually gets burned in the incinerator. So the county is trying to use more zero waste program management in order to manage their waste, which means that we'll be getting more compost, hopefully, in the future to use in our gardens. There are a variety of groups working to help the county with these plans. The Food Council Environmental Impact Working Group, which I co-chair and worked on helping with the county create the strategic plan. They are educating people on composting programs, tracking the county's progress, and they research models the county can use to increase the impact of their programs. Every year, master gardeners are trained on the best practices for composting and compost use, and they pass on what they learn to gardeners in the county. Next year, we're hoping to expand trainings to offer master composter sessions for master gardeners, farmers, and community gardeners. Look for updates on the county website, on the UMD extension site under Montgomery County Master Gardener, and if you're interested in getting more involved with Food Council work, you can just Google Montgomery County Food Council Environmental Impact Working Group and come join us. Thanks so much. And now I think we're going to jump to the questions. Well, in a minute, but I wanted to say thank you so much for being here today. We're so lucky. And uh, out there, if you have any gardening questions or questions regarding any of the programs we've mentioned and have on our website, the link should be posted shortly. Please remember to include your email in case we need to follow up. You can also view previously answered questions from In the Garden on YouTube. Um, since our last program, we've received the following questions. Number one. Uh, and this is for Susan. How can I get a good balance of greens to browns for my compost if I have lots of greens from my garden now, but not a lot of browns since I ran out of leaves? What should I do? Well, I can definitely relate to this qu question. 
And I think we have a picture that we can put up. And I want to say, um, good for you to collecting up your leaves in the fall. That's exactly what um, all gardeners should be doing. Instead of putting them out to the curb, if you can collect them out and put them in bags and store them for your composting throughout the gardening year and into the fall um, before the leaves fall again, you're going to have a good stock of browns for your compost. And as you know, the ideal ratio for composting is about three buckets of browns to one bucket of greens. Um, But if you have to, you can actually get away with two buckets of browns to one bucket of greens. And um, when I run out of browns, what I actually do, and um, I don't know if we can get the picture up, is that I actually, when I clear things out of the garden, um, when I'm doing my weeding or cutting um, certain plants, right now I just cleared out um, some lettuce that was going to seed. Um, It wasn't quite at seed point, but it was uh, starting to flower. So I just cut it, I set it aside next to my compost and let it go to brown. It actually then becomes the carbon for my composting. So that's one way that you can do it if you haven't collected enough leaves. Um, Maybe we can show that picture later. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Our next question is about maple trees. My maple trees are turning brown. What is happening? The same thing is happening to most of these trees in my neighborhood. Steve, would you take this? Sure, sure, Melissa. Yeah, so We've been noticing, a lot of folks have been noticing in their neighborhood, a lot of our larger native shade trees are, are dying back, and oaks included, but also maples. And some of this is probably attributed to, you know, climate change. Um, there's a period of, of time when things are getting very wet, and then the periods of time they're getting very, very dry. And it's putting a bit of stress on some of these plants and um, these trees. And over time, it's going to have a cumulative effect. And weakens the plant, predisposes it, and then secondary things will come in like bores or maybe a root rot. So it may be a, a, a collection of things. And some of the pictures that were, they were shown to us, there are some trees that are completely dead, some that are partially dead, um, and they're dying back. But this is, as you go around the neighborhood, you, you probably see this quite a bit more. Um, and it's probably happened to certain trees because uh, the trees are kind of like, you know, I guess they're like us. As we get older, we, we accumulate some issues and we get a little stressed and we get a little weakened. And those trees that probably may be in competition with other trees or the soil is not as optimum, they fail out first. And so so that's what's happening. So plant materials that are probably a little bit more um, than uh, stressed over, over the years are, are, are dying out. And I think because of climate change, we're seeing more of this more frequent. And, that, and that's my opinion there. I think we're just seeing more of that. A lot of it happened on white oaks. A lot of it happened to our sugar maples, too. And we're on sort of the southern edge where they kind of, as this tree starts to decline, to check in with an arborist. They can give you an evaluation, maybe what to do. Sometimes it's, you just get a collection of dead branches and limbs in there and have That person or that crew come in and clean out your tree would be very, very helpful. But um, yeah, periodically, um, yeah, you may want to consult with a professional arborist and you get their website. Uh, go to the website, the Maryland, Maryland Department of Natural Resources website, and you can find a, a certified arborist certified by the state by your zip code there. Great. Thank you so much. Our next question is, what is wrong with my lamb's ear leaves? My flower bed has some mulch. I have not been watering the plants, even though I have not had much rain. What should I do uh, to stop it? Well, the the, uh, scientific name for lamb's ear is Stachys byzantine, and it's actually native to the Middle East. It grows best in full sun, fairly dry conditions, and good air circulation. It's prone to both root rot and a variety of fungal diseases uh, during the humid summers, and we're experiencing one of those right now. Root rot occurs when the soil is not well drained. It also does not like rich soil that holds water. Um, The leaves will begin to shrivel up. 
Even in well-drained soil, some summer die-out may occur during the humid summer months. Uh, my neighbor has a big uh, bed of this and it's beautiful, but it is also starting to show the same signs. The fuzzy leaves can hold moisture, which leads to fungal leaf spot. Be careful not to get the leaves wet when they're watering. Um, a good practice would be to do um, drip irrigation rather than watering from, watering from on top. And root rot occurs when the soil is uh, not well drained. Um, you should remove and dispose of the dead leaves, including from the ground around the plant. And this helps the spread of the fungal spores. Remove leaves from the base of the plant to allow for good air circulation. Too much shade will also prevent the leaves from drying after a rain. Thank you so much for the question. Our next question is suddenly look and see every leaf on three 20 year old formerly happy viburnum all drooping downwards and looking like imminent death. Help with thoughts or pass on to pros you are working on in the garden now. It has sprinkler system watering every morning, every other plant and two trees in that bed are doing great. Steve? Yeah. Um I'm, I'm not certain what's happening here, but um, the problems, and I should back up, but the five burners normally don't receive a lot of, uh, it's interesting, this plant's been in the landscape uh, for a number of years. Um, it may be that the, the tree is at some point previously and they're they're prone to cankers and so what, what a canker is is it's an area on on the, uh, the branch or the trunk where the fungus or the bacteria or the causal agent is either moved in or it's moving out it's generally often both it's the same place where it infects the tree kind of keeps that area it's almost like an open kind of wound kind of thing and then it becomes a choke point there so anything above that point it's not getting water uh, as much as it should, and it starts to flag and starts to fail, and it looks like it's wilting. So sometimes it affects just half the plant. Sometimes it's the whole plant disappear where location of canker is. Um, these plants seem to be fairly old and over, you know, overgrown. Maybe there's a lack of light. They've got weakened. Um, they may need to be rejuvenated. But my first thing is to look along the branch and look for that canker. If they do have that canker, there's not too much you can do you know, to um, pour the plant other than remove that part of the plant, uh, um, cut right below the canker and remove that. And often that will have a really um, beneficial regenerative effect to the plant. The plant will start sucking out new shoots and a sort of, it'll, it'll take a while to recuperate. Um, it took a number of years to get that bit, it'll take a, while, uh, a few years to kind of fill back in if, that, if that's the case. It also may be a combination of other things to allow of light. So look at the light levels of your things. Sometimes you can't change the light levels. Um, so my guess, it, it's a canker or possibly a, a root rot. And as we mentioned kind of earlier, we're going through a dry spell. We get a dry spell, we get the, the roots get weakened. And then if we get a heavy rain, then the roots get flooded. And that's sometimes is a little tough on some of the plants and you you, you get a root rot but it, it came as a plant as a result of planting weak in the previous stress so the best advice is to hopefully not terribly uh, 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 um, what you can do for that other than hopefully hopefully it'll, it'll grow out of it in time Great. I have another question for you, Steve. What is wrong with my lilacs? The leaf edges are turning brown. Okay. Uh, Steve? Okay. Uh, what? There you go. <laughs> so, um, Generally, plants in, in, in uh, lilacs are in the olive family. Generally, plants in the olive family are very tough and they're uh, usually prone to, to deer, uh, uh, are prone or resistant to deer browsing. But they do get a few problems. They do get, occasionally, they get bores. Well, big foliar disease is, as much as snow, is powdery mildew. 
but they do get some other problems too. They occasionally get some bacterial problems and bacterial leaf spot. And I think much you, you would manage a bacterial leaf spot similar to a fungal leaf spot. Um, you want to increase the air circulation, any leaves that have fallen, you know, you get, get rid of those. Um, uh, one of the things is if you do opt to use, go to chemical control, uh, since it's a bacterial issue, um, most of the fungicides won't have um, a great effect on it unless you get a fungicide that has something specifically labeled for that. But most of the time, if you can manage it and tolerate a little bit of leaf spot and, and you try to improve their circulation a little bit of management, you'll, you'll probably do fine. Great. The severity will vary from year to year. Um, you Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, okay. okay great. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. The next question is lilac and maple with white fluff on bark. Any idea what the white stuff is? My maples are also having this white fluffy material on the stems. What is it and how can I get rid of it? I'm experiencing the very same thing in my garden on my milkweed. And I was worried that it might hurt um, any butterfly caterpillars that got on there. But it's just a woolly leaf hopper. Clusters of fluffy white plant hopper nymph are, are appearing on stems of annuals and perennials and lower branches of trees and shrubs right now. The plant hopper adults are about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch long. They're purplish blue, lime green, or powdery white, and they hold their broad wings vertically in a tent-like fashion, covering the sides of the body and legs. Plant hoppers are related to aphids, and the nymphs are sometimes mistaken for woolly aphids. However, plant hoppers hop, aphids just mosey around. The nymphs of several plant hopper species cloak themselves in a dense tangle of waxy white fluff. They congregate in groups or colonies, they're called, and their profusion of material on affected plant stems and leaves draws attention to many different kinds of insects. The nymphs also produce copi copious quantities of honeydew and uh, that may coat the plant and become colonized by black sooty molds. Plant hoppers usually have little impact on the overall health of um, landscape plants and seldom become a nuisance pest. Um, plant hopper nymphs can be killed with insecticidal soap, which will also wash away the fluff, and, um, or by using a standard insecticide labeled for use on the host plant. So good luck. It hasn't really affected my yard too much, but it is on my milkweed, so I understand your problem. Um, okay, our next question is, uh, I just added a lot of greens and browns to my compost, and it's not getting hot. What should I do? Susan? Okay. Um, thanks for asking this question. Um, it's, a, it's a common one and an important one to know about. Um, you need to check the ratio of the greens and browns you're combining. Should be, as I mentioned before, about one bucket to two to three buckets of browns, one bucket of green to about two to three buckets of brown. And it's possible that you have too much browns and if so, then you'll need to um, add some greens from the garden to heat up the compost. The majority of heat in compost comes from the biological activity that microbes create when they're eating and reproducing in the compost it's, itself. And that's why they need the right mix, the right recipe of greens to brown foods. Also, We've been having a lot of rain recently. And while that's been wonderful for our gardens, too much rain in a compost pile can smother the microbes and slow down their activity. So you might need to either turn your compost or stir it up, fluff it, add some air to it. And as you're doing it, you can also add some browns to soak up the extra moisture. You can do a simple moisture test of your compost by reaching into the compost, grabbing a handful of it, squeezing it, 
And if the water drips down your arm, then it's got too much moisture in it. If when you open it up, you can see that the compost has been compacted together and it looks kind of glossy and it feels like a, a soft, moist sponge, then it's got the perfect amount of moisture. So that's one way that you can test to see whether there's too much moisture in it. Um, so that's, that's how you would um, manage your troubleshoot your pile and your compost. Can you talk any about any bit about worms in your compost? Um, well, worms are welcome in, in compost. They come in typically at the, there's a whole series of different types of microbes and critters that come into your compost to decompose the material. And worms typically are at the end and they also like to chew on and eat your carbon. So it would be the leaves. Um, if you have any sticks that are in there that are breaking down, they're oftentimes at the bottom of the pile and they're great for being able to finish off the pile. And I usually, when I'm, I've got a finished amount of compost that still has some worms in it, I'll just scoop that up. I don't even um, screen it because screening can actually break up the worms and also break up some of the, the fungal um, hyphaea that's in the compost. I just scoop it up, put it on top of, say, for example, if I have a, a tomato plant, I'll sprinkle it around the tomato plant and the, then put leaves on top of the compost in order to hold the moisture in and also protect it from the heat. And you're good to go and there'll always be, there usually are worms in there that then go into your garden. Thank you. That's great. All right. Our next question is, what are the lower leaves on the cherry tomato turning yellow? Is it a disease? How can I prevent it? So nutrient deficiency is the likely cause. The most common reason why the leaves on established tomato plants turn yellow is a lack of nutrients in the soil. Tomato, tomato plants are extremely heavy feeders and require plenty of nutrients to grow healthy and be fruitful. Signs of nutrient deficiency often start low on the tomato plant. Uh, nitrogen deficiency of tomato crop is typically carry, characterized by older leaves that gradually change from green to yellowish. These leaves will later become yellow and under extreme nitrogen deficiency, they're likely to become bright yellow or white. So um, a good feeding of nitrogen would probably help you out on that. Our next question is... Um, about invasive grass weed. This is an unknown weed. It's taken over my front yard and I mow the grass at three and a half inches. I need recommendations for control. Every year I plant grass seed and it grows, but then this stuff and purple violets take over. Steve? Yeah, um, it looks like um, still grass, um, which is a real, real common problem for many of us. It's, um, it's a, a relatively new weed it's been here for a few years but as it moves into new areas it's becoming uh, you know new to certain people some people say well i've had this for years it, it's a tough weed um it's a it's a warm season annual grass and it likes kind of shady damp areas but it's fairly it will make it into relatively sunny areas too the way that you mow it, you fertilize it other times for many of us, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. There are pesticides that are labeled to control still grass. But in Montgomery County, um, there are uh, restrictive um, on what you can use in a lawn. Um, there, you go to the Montgomery County Department of Environment Protection, and you Google that and maybe say turf law or pesticide law, that probably will take you to a site and it'll probably be like almost like your first click that'll list the pesticides that are labeled that are honey. Um, so still grass is an annual. And so probably the best way to control this 
if you use a chemical, is to use a pre-emergent. Right now, there aren't really good pre-emergent options, but there's check the website periodically. Certain you know um, uh, pesticides may be included in the future, but right now it it is more prevalent. Like, make sure your pH is in range. Um, you can hand pull it; it is easy to pull up, um, but it, once it's been there for a few years, the seed that originally, you know, came a few years ago will be germinating over several years. So it'll take several years of hand pulling. It's so to get it suppressed that it really just, you know, you've got a handle on it. And then, of course, if it's all around you in your neighbors or the woods or whatever, it, it will be a constant battle. But the sunnier, drier sites, probably still grass won't do as well as our other turf grasses like zoysia grass and tall fescue. So it, it's a tough situation. Um, and um, you know, wish them good luck. Uh, it, it, it does pull up easy. It does pull up easy. So you've got small patches, you can pull that up before you get started. Great. Um, another so, question. Just on good luck to them. Sorry, another question on that would be, um, can you get uh, remnants of other people's lawns by having, a, say, a, a common lawn mower. Um, can you get it that way? Oh, the the seed, yeah. You, you, you can get you can get off a common lawn mower, sure, absolutely. And, and that's a really good question. It goes sometimes diseases or pests or things. How did I get it? It could come off of other equipment, and you know, say it's all. Uh, um, you have a landscape company, you contract. It, it, it's it's possible, but it's also possible. It could come in mm. whole wide a variety of other ways. We we track in plant swappers who are in practice, like at golf courses and where they share equipment. That many of the, the professionals, what they do is they clean off their equipment each day to, to help minimize the spread of disease diseases and insects and, and weed seed and things like that. It's hard to say. Right. Well, thank you. Um, our next question, uh, uh, why are my sunflower leaves turning brown and dying? They're yellowish. Are they, are they dying? What should I do? And until recently, I've gotten a lot of rain. So this is all Ternaria leaf blight. It's young leaf spots are small, dark, and angular. Leaf spots usually are found between major leaf veins, along leaf margins and tips, and will coalesce. Um, extensive yellowing occurs, followed by browning and leaf death. Defoliation occurs from the ground up. Stem, stem lesions are dark, narrow, elliptical, and about a half an inch to one and a half inches long. Um, factors favoring development are rainfall shortly after you plant the tomatoes and warm, humid weather. Um, disease development is highly dependent on rain and dew and plants at flowering and seed filling stages, stages are more susceptible than young plants. Fungus survives on plant residue. Crop rotation is really important. So if you grow something one year on one side of your garden, bring it to the other side and then make sure that you pick up all of the leaves and the plant material and throw it away at the end of the season. Um, it can be confused with septoria leaf blight, uh, bacterial leaf spot. And then again, drip irrigation is the way to go rather than watering from the top. I wanna compost my food scraps from my kitchen, but I don't want to attract rodents. Is there a way I can do that? Susan? Yeah, um, there are a couple of ways to compost food scraps in a way that prevents rodent attraction. First off, you should know that Montgomery County Recycling and Resource Management Division just launched a program, as I mentioned before, to pilot rodent-proof composting containers for, for food scraps. Once they've completed the testing of this, they're, they're going to notify residents of the containers that they can use. Because as you might know, the geo bins that they hand out for free are not rodent proof. Typically, 
tumblers are rodent proof. They actually um, are um, oftentimes on stands and they are fully enclosed, but they do have air holes. You have to add more water to them if they need more water because they are totally enclosed. Unfortunately, tumblers do take a little bit more management. And if you're putting food scraps in, in them, because food scraps are very high in water or moisture, then you have to make sure that, that you're adding a little bit more of the browns or the leaves in order to soak up the food scraps. Um, and these, the, the, um, the, the tumblers are like barrels. They actually look like barrels, which you can then crank and turn in order to mix up the compost. Sometimes they have two chambers where the, you can have a side-by-side -side where you can start compost in one chamber and then switch it over to another or start another one as a second compost while the, the first compost is composting. Um, and that may be the type that, that the county is testing. There's another container that the county is testing, which kind of looks like a Darth Vader helmet. It's black plastic. It uh, almost looks like an upside down uh, garbage can. And it, you can screw off the top. Um, it has an opening that's about uh, two and a half feet by two and a half feet um, in diam diameter. And you can actually get a pitchfork in to turn the compost or fluff it up. Um, they're testing these con containers. And they if you put hardware cloth on the bottom, um, that can also protect from rodents going into it from um, below or voles sometimes. But also another way to protect from it is to be able to use um, leaves on the bottom of your compost because that acts as a filter. Um, rodents can't smell the, the food scraps that you add to it. And then you can also put leaves on top in order to break the odor and get the compost going in a way that that's not going to attract um, the rodents. And then finally, there's um, a way that you can collect up your food scraps and put it into um, like a 32 gallon um, uh, stainless steel garbage can. Um, and sometimes you can find them with actual um, holes along the sides. They're made for composting and the, the, the holes are very small. And so it just lets air into it. And you can take your, your food scraps out from the kitchen, dump it into the, the can, throw some leaves on top of it. And then once it gets to about half full or three quarters full, then you can add it to your compost. And that actually reduces the attraction of the smells or the taste for the rodents. Um, so there, those are a variety of ways. And also make sure that when you are setting up your composting, make sure that you, the area that you have is quite open and not cluttered because rodents like clutter and they also like to hide behind. So like two and a half feet clearance from a compost container to a fence is really what's recommended so that um, rodents don't like to be seen. They don't like to be in the light. And so that would help um, prevent the ro rodents. So in a barrel, how often would you r rotate it? Um, you'd have to look at what the size is and also what's recommended by the company. But typically, it, after you add to it and you add your food scraps and some of the, the, the browns to it, um, some people also use newspaper that can be used because it's soy-based ink. But typically, that's only if you run out of your, your carbon source. Um, you, leaves are the best source. You add it in give it a turn, and then wait a couple of days to see whether it needs more moisture, a little bit of adjustment of moisture. Um, and then usually, you know, if you're adding kitchen scraps, it's on a either weekly basis or um, a couple times a week. So you'll be able to see um, after you add it, you give it a couple of turns. Okay, thanks. All right.
Uh, let's see. Well, those are all the questions we have. Bev, do you have anything um, on, on the live link? Uh, no, we don't. Not today. Okay. Well, to submit a question, go to our link. Um, please enter as much detail as possible. Photos are welcome and they're really important. Uh, the cutoff for inclusion in the next session of the In the Garden program is this Friday at 6 p.m. to be answered on Tuesday, the second, the third of August. Wow, summer's going quickly. Um, please include your email in case we need to follow up and we'll make every effort to answer your questions on air. But if we run out of time on our show, we'll provide you with an answer by email. Thanks so much, Bev and Steve, wherever you went. And thanks so much for all of you joining us. And thank you really to our researchers, Sheila, Layla, Mary, and Susan. Um, most are um, new master gardeners, and this is a great way for them to learn about things, and they've done a great job. So thanks so much. Our next garden program will be August the 3rd at noon. And remember, if you have any questions you'd like answered, please contact us at the link on the screen and uh, do that by July 28th at 6 p.m. See you again. Bye. Thank you so